Chapter 1 of What Men Live By This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org What Men Live By by Leo Tolstoy Translated by L. and A. Mode Chapter 1 Part 1 a shoemaker named Simon, who had neither house nor land of his own, lived with his wife and children in a peasant's hut, and earned his living by his work. Work was cheap, but bread was dear, and what he earned, he spent for food. The man and his wife had but one sheepskin coat between them for winter wear, and even that was torn to tatters, and this was the second year he had been wanting to buy sheepskins for a new coat. Before winter, Simon saved up a little money. A three-rouble note lay hidden in his wife's box, and five roubles and twenty kopecks were owed him by customers in the village. So one morning he prepared to go to the village to buy the sheepskins. He put on over his shirt his wife's wadded nankeen jacket, and over that he put his own cloth coat. He took the three-rouble note in his pocket, cut himself a stick to serve as a staff, and started off after breakfast. I will collect the five roubles that were due to me, thought he, and the three I have got, and that will be enough to buy sheepskins for the winter coat. He came to the village and called at a peasant's hut, but the man was not at home. The peasant's wife promised that the money would be paid next week, but she would not pay it herself. Then Simon called on another peasant, but this one swore he had no money, and would only pay twenty kopecks which he owed for a pair of boots Simon had mended. Simon then tried to buy sheepskins on credit, but the dealer would not trust him. Bring your money, said he, then you may have your pick of skins. We know what debt collecting is like. So all the business the shoemaker did was to get the twenty kopecks for the boots he had mended, and to take a pair of felt boots a peasant gave him to sole with leather. Simon felt downhearted. He spent the twenty kopecks on vodka and started homewards without having bought any skins. In the morning he had felt the frost, but now, after drinking the vodka, he felt warm, even without a sheepskin coat. He trudged along, striking a stick on the frozen earth with one hand, swinging the felt boots with the other, and talking to himself. I am quite warm, said he, though I have no sheepskin coat. I have had a drop, and it runs through all my veins. I need no sheepskins. I go long and don't worry about anything. That's the sort of man I am. What do I care? I can live without sheepskins. I don't need them. My wife will fret, to be sure. And, true enough, it's a shame. One works all day long and then does not get paid. Stop a bit. If you don't bring that money along, sure I will skin you. Blessed if I don't. How's that? He pays twenty kopecks at a time? What can I do with twenty kopecks? Drink it, that's all one can do. Hard up, he says he is. So he may be. But what about me? You have a house, and cattle, and everything. I have only what I stand up in. You have corn of your own growing. I have to buy every grain. Do what I will, I must spend three roubles every week for bread alone. I come home and find bread all used up, and I have to fork out another rouble and a half, so just pay up what you owe and no nonsense about it. By this time he had reached the shrine at the bend of the road. Looking up, he saw something whitish behind the shrine. The daylight was fading, and the shoemaker peered at the thing without being able to make out what it was. There was no white stone here before. Can it be an ox? It's not like an ox. It has a head like a man, but it's too wide. And what could a man be doing there? He came closer, so that it was clearly visible. To his surprise, it really was a man, alive or dead, sitting naked, leaning motionless against the shrine. Terror seized the shoemaker, and he thought, Someone has killed him, stripped him, and left him here. If I meddle, I shall surely get into trouble. So the shoemaker went on. He passed in front of the shrine, so that he could not see the man. 
when he had gone away he looked back and saw that the man was no longer leaning against the shrine but was moving as if looking towards him the shoemaker felt more frightened than before and thought shall i go back to him or shall i go on if i go near him something dreadful may happen who knows who this fellow is he has not come here for any good if i go near him he may jump up and throttle me and there will be no getting away or if not he would still be a burden on one's hands what could i do with a naked man i couldn't give him my last clothes heaven only help me to get away so the shoemaker hurried on leaving the shrine behind him when suddenly his conscience smote him and he stopped in the road what are you doing simon said he to himself the man may be dying of want and you slip past afraid have you grown so rich to be afraid of robbers ha ah, simon shame on you so he turned back and went up to the man simon approached the stranger looked at him and saw that he was a young man fit with no bruises on his body only evidently freezing and frightened and he had sat there leaning back without looking up at simon as if too faint to lift his eyes simon went close to him and then the man seemed to wake up turning his head he opened his eyes and looked into simon's face that one look was enough to make simon fond of the man he threw the felt boots on the ground and did his sash laid it on the boots and took off his cloth coat it's not time for talking said he come put this coat on at once and simon took the man by elbows and helped him to rise as he stood there simon saw that his body was clean and in good condition his hands and feet shapely and his face good and kind he threw his coat over the man's shoulders but the latter could not find the sleeves simon guided his arm into them and drawing the coat well on wrapped it loosely about him trying to shash around the man's waist simon even took off his stone cap to put it on the man's head but then his own head felt cold and he thought i am quite bald while he has long curly hair so he put his cap on his own head again it will be better to give him something for his feet thought he and he made the man sit down and helped him put on the felt boots saying there friend now move about and warm yourself other matters can be settled later on can you walk the man stood up and looked kindly at simon but could not say a word why don't you speak said simon it's too cold to stay here we must be getting home there now take my stick and if you're feeling weak lean on that now step out the man started walking and moving easily not lagging behind as they went along simon asked him and where do you belong to i am not from these parts i thought as much i know the folks hereabouts but how did you come to be there by the shrine i cannot tell has some one been ill treating you no one has ill treated me god has punished me of course god rules all still you will have to find food and shelter somewhere where do you want to go it's all the same to me simon was amazed the man did not look like a rogue and he spoke gently but yet he gave no account of himself still simon thought who knows what may have happened and he said to the stranger well then come home with me and at least warm yourself a while so simon walked towards his home and the stranger kept up with him walking at his side the wind had risen and simon felt it cold under his shirt he was getting over his tipsiness by now and began to feel the frost he went along sniffing and wrapping his wife's coat round him and he thought to himself there now talk about sheepskins i went out for sheepskins and come home without even a coat to my back and what is more i am bringing a naked man along with me matriona won't be pleased and when he thought of his wife he felt sad but when he looked at the stranger and remembered how he had looked up at him at the shrine his heart was glad simon's wife had everything ready early that day she had cut wood brought water fed the children eaten her own meal and now she sat thinking she wondered when she ought to make bread now or tomorrow 
there was still a large piece left if simon has had some dinner in the town thought she and does not eat much for supper the bread will last out another day she weighed the piece of bread in her hand again and again and thought i won't make any more today we have only enough flour left to bake one batch we can manage to make this last out till friday so matryona put away the bread and sat down at the table to patch her husband's shirt while she worked she thought how her husband was buying skins for the winter coat if only the dealer does not cheat him my good man is much too simple he cheats nobody but any child can take him in eight roubles is a lot of money he should get a good coat at that price not tanned skins but still a proper winter coat how difficult it was last winter to get on without a warm coat i could neither get down to the river nor go out anywhere when he went out he put on all we had and there was nothing left for me he did not start very early today but still it's time he was back i only hope he has not gone on the spree hardly had matryona thought this when steps were heard on the threshold and someone entered matryona struck her needle in her work and went into the passage there she saw two men simon and with him a man without a hat and wearing felt boots matryona noticed at once that her husband smelt of spirits there now he has been drinking thought she and when she saw that he was coatless had only a jacket on brought no parcel stood there silent and seemed ashamed her heart was ready to break with the disappointment he has drunk the money thought she and has been on the spree with some good for nothing fellow whom he has brought home with him matryona let them pass into the hut followed them in and saw that the stranger was a young slight man wearing her husband's coat there was no shirt to be seen under it and he had no hat having entered he stood neither moving nor raising his eyes and matryona thought he must be a bad man he is afraid matryona frowned and stood beside the oven looking to see what they would do simon took off his cap and sat down on the bench as if things were all right come matryona if supper is ready let us have some matryona muttered something to herself and did not move but stayed where she was by the oven she looked first at the one and then at the other of them and only shook her head simon saw that his wife was annoyed but tried to pass it off pretending not to notice anything he took the stranger by the arm sit down friend said he let us have some supper the stranger sat down on the bench haven't you cooked anything for us said simon matryona's anger boiled over i have cooked but not for you it seems to me you have drunk your wits away you went out to buy sheepskin coat but come home without so much as the coat you had on and bring a naked vagabond home with you i have no supper for drunkards like you that's enough matryona don't wag your tongue without reason you had better ask what sort of a man and you tell me what you've done with the money simon found the pocket of the jacket drew out the 3 rouble note and unfolded it here is the money trifonov did not pay but promises to pay soon matryona got still more angry he had bought no sheep skin but had put his only coat on some naked fellow and had even brought him to their house she snatched up the note from the table took it to put away in safety and said i have no supper for you we can't feed all the naked drunkards in the world there now matryona hold your tongue a bit first hear what a man has to say much wisdom i shall hear from a drunken fool i was afraid if not wanting to marry you a drunkard the linen my mother gave me you drank and now you have been to buy a coat and you have drunk it too simon tried to explain to his wife that he had only spent 20 kopecks tried to tell how he had found the man but matryona would not let him get a word in she talked 19 to the dozen and dragged in things that happened 10 years before matryona talked and talked and at last she flew at simon and seized him by the sleeve give me my jacket it's the only one i have and you must needs take it from me and wear it yourself give it here you mangy dog and may the devil take you 
Simon began to pull off the jacket and turn the sleeve of it inside out. Matriona seized the jacket and it burst its seams. She snatched it up, threw it over her head and went to the door. She meant to go out, but stopped undecided. She wanted to work off her anger, but she also wanted to learn what sort of a man the stranger was. Matriona stopped and said, If he were a good man, he would not be naked. Why hasn't he even a shirt on him? If he were all right, you would say where you came across the fellow. That's just what I am trying to tell you, said Simon. As I came to the shrine, I saw him sitting all naked and frozen. It isn't quite the weather to sit about naked. God sent me to him, or he would have perished. What was I to do? How do we know what may have happened to him? So I took him, clothed him and brought him along. Don't be so angry, Matriona. It's a sin. Remember, we all must die one day. Angry words rose to Matriona's lips. But she looked at the stranger and was silent. He sat on the edge of the bench, motionless, his hands folded on his knees, his head drooping on his breast, his eyes closed, and his brows knit as if in pain. Matriona was silent, and Simon said, Matriona, have you no love of God? Matriona heard these words, and as she looked at the stranger, suddenly her heart softened towards him. She came back from the door, and going to the oven, she got out the supper. Setting a cup on the table, she poured out some kvass, then she brought the last piece of bread, and set out a knife and spoons. Eat if you want to, said she. Simon drew the stranger to the table. Take your place, young man, said he. Simon cut the bread, crumbled it into the broth, and they began to eat. Matriona sat at the corner of the table, resting her head on her hand and looking at the stranger. And Matriona was touched with the pity for the stranger, and began to feel fond of him. And at once the stranger's face lit up. His brows were no longer bent. He raised his eyes and smiled at Matriona. When they had finished supper, the woman cleared away the things and began questioning the stranger. Where are you from? said she. I am not from these parts. How did you come to be on the road? I may not tell. Did someone rob you? God punished me. And you were lying there naked? Yes, naked and freezing. Simon saw me and had pity on me. He took off his coat and put it on me and brought me here. And you have fed me, given me drink and shown pity on me. God will reward you. Matriona rose, took from the window Simon's old shirt she had been patching, and gave it to the stranger. She also brought out a pair of trousers for him. There, said she, I see you have no shirt. Put this on, and lie down where you please, in the loft or on the oven. The stranger took off the coat, put on the shirt, and lay down in the loft. Matriona put out the candle, took the coat and climbed to where her husband lay. Matriona drew the skirts of the coat over her and lay down, but could not sleep. She could not get the stranger out of her mind. When she remembered that they had eaten their last piece of bread, and that there was none for tomorrow, and thought of the shirt and trousers she had given away, she felt grieved. But when she remembered how he had smiled, her heart was glad. Long did Matriona lay awake, and she noticed that Simon was also awake. He drew the coat towards him. Simon, well, you have had the last of the bread and I have not put any to rice. I don't know what we shall do tomorrow. Perhaps I can borrow some from neighbor Martha. If we are alive, we will find something to eat. The woman lay still a while and then said, He seems a good man, but why does he not tell us who he is? I suppose he has his reasons. Simon, well, we give, but why does nobody give us anything? Simon did not know what to say, so he only said, Let us stop talking, and turned over and went to sleep. In the morning Simon awoke. The children were still asleep. His wife had gone to the neighbors to borrow some bread. The stranger alone was sitting on the bench, dressed in the old shirt and trousers, and looking upwards. His face was brighter than it had been the day before. Simon said to him, 
Well, friend, the belly wants bread, and the naked body clothes. One has to work for a living. What work do you know? I don't know any. This surprised Simon. But he said, Men who want to learn can learn anything. Men work, and I will work also. What is your name? Michael. Well, Michael, if you don't wish to talk about yourself, that is your own affair. But you'll have to earn a living for yourself. If you will work, as I tell you, I will give you food and shelter. May God reward you. I will learn. Show me what to do. Simon took a yarn, put it round his thumb and began to twist. It is easy enough. See? Michael watched him, put some yarn round his own thumb in the same way, caught the neck and twisted the yarn also. Then Simon showed him how to wax the thread. This also Michael mastered. Next Simon showed him how to twist the bristle in and how to sew. And this too Michael learned at once. Whatever Simon showed him he understood at once. And after three days he worked as if he had sewn boots all his life. He worked without stopping and ate little. When work was over he sat silently looking upwards. He hardly went into the street, spoke only when necessary, and neither joked nor laughed. They never saw him smile except that first evening when Matriona gave them supper. End of chapter 1 part 1 Read by Lambda